So hello, many thanks for coming over. Uh, this is a presentation on virtual field trips as a service, and I'll explain as we go along what we mean by this. And uh, the names that you see on, on the slides are my colleague, David Burden. He works for a company called Dayden, and they were involved in developing a virtual skid door field trip. And I'll explain what, what I mean by that, that as well. I hope you're able to see the slide because of the graphics. It does take a bit of time to load, but I hope you can see them. Now, what happened in 2013 was that we got some funding and we developed a virtual skid door application. Skid door are, are mountains in the Lake District and my colleague Tom Argus, who is in the audience and a geologist, he regularly conducts field trips in, in uh, Skid Door Mountains. He takes students there thrice uh, in a year, sometimes even more, depending upon the group size of our students. And our open university students go for the field trip there. And what we did was we, th these activities were already designed for the Skid Door Mountains and many of these activities were available on a DVD. And what we, when we got this funding in 2013, we thought, why not make a 3D uh, virtual trip, a virtual field trip to the Skiddaw Mountains, so that whatever activities we had in our, in our materials and on our DVD, we would develop them into this 3D application. So Dayton was the company who worked with us to develop this, and the application has been developed in Unity 3D. It supports many of the things that we do on a physical field trip. And there are many things that are not possible to do in a real field trip that are also supported by this virtual field trip. So what we did was we brought in an area of 10 kilometers by 10 kilometers into this area. And it is a, a multi, uh, it's a multi avatar environment, a multi user environment. People can walk, fly and teleport. There is also a compass provided. And there are also maps, which are the terrain maps, the geology maps and the ordnance survey maps, which get draped onto the mountains. And there are there are four such there are six such sites and students perform different activities on, on different sites. So what happens is, let, let me take the example of site one. When the students come on to site one, they can practice sketching. They can pick up a rock and look at it under a virtual microscope. Now, virtual microscope is an application that we developed at the Open University in which you can see samples of rocks under a microscope. You can adjust the microscope as well, and everything is in a 2D application. So we have bridged this virtual microscope, a 2D application, into our virtual skid door. So students can practice looking at the, the rocks under this microscope. They can look at, uh, they can compare it against a grain chart. And as they go further down, they can also, uh, they can also look at, they can uh, overlay the maps over the mountains. And there are some other things also, some non-realistic things like they can fly, they can see the cut through to the mountain, so a slice of the mountain comes up. So there is a mix of things. So sketching is something which is a very valid, uh, valid fieldwork skill that they can practice. And this is something that you can do in real life. But overlaying the mountains on the maps or seeing the, the cut through to the mountains, those are things which are not possible to do in, in real life, but they are possible to do in this 3D virtual world. And also the, three, the six sites in real life are quite far from one another. But here the students can fly and go across the site. So if they've completed the activities on one site, they can go on to the second site. And what we've done is, it, it is very much a self-learning uh, self package. So Tom, my colleague, has recorded all the audio in it. That is just as when you come to a site and you're on a geological field trip, a tutor will introduce you to the various activities. He'll give you about the geological history of that place. So as to introduce them to the students, what, what things they should be looking for as they go along. All these things have been recorded and both as voice as well as as transcripts within this application. 
And what students do is they can also access a PDF file, which is available on the website as well, so that they can they can look through the PDF file before coming into a 3D the 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 the, the, the 3D environment. But um, uh, and there is also on the website we've provided a fieldwork toolkit, which is uh, which is a which is a kind of um, the skills that the student needs to conduct fieldwork. They can also read it about into a in in a document and then come on to practice this field work skills. On the next side, slide, what you'll find is that you'll find a number of avatars. And uh, these are avatars who have come in to perform this activity. So very much simulating uh, a virtual field trip in which there would be a number of avatars working and working together. And we've got a photon server at the background, which is uh, which helps us in engaging this multi-user functionality within our application. It's a cloud-based application, and all the communications are managed through this photon server. There is also facility, and like in Second Life, like I'm speaking, we don't have that currently in our virtual Skiddo application, but we do have a chat functionality. So when avatars come in, they can speak to one another. The tutor can guide them. But then there is also a very interesting functionality that the tutor can see or the students themselves can see who all are online within the application at any particular time. They can also see on which side they are. So as I mentioned, there are sites one to six, and if a tutor wanted to find out where a particular student is, he can immediately see on which side that student is. And also the communications can be, you can, you can restrict the chat distance. So there can be some chat which is only within the local area, but you can have it in all the six areas. So if a tutor wanted to is in site one and he wanted to speak to somebody in site six, he can have that chat distance to speak to somebody in site six. So this is beyond realism where you can have these kinds of conversations across distances by using the chat facility. There is also a fading facility. So sometimes, as my colleague Tom advises us, that sometimes people come in the way while you are sketching the rocks or if you are making observations. And at that time, you would just like those people to disappear. So there is a functionality within this where you can make the avatars fade away. You can, and that is, that, that is quite helpful when you are sketching. One another thing that we did in this was that Tom, my colleague, was very keen that students, in spite of working in a virtual environment, they should still have the sketching skills, etc., and working in a real fieldwork notebook. Hence, we don't have an online notebook. The students are st still expected, while they are being driven through the various activities in this virtual world, they are still doing all the sketching, the observations in a real world field notebook, just to give them those basic skills. And how to maintain a field work notebook, how to do sketching, how to use the compass, what do the different maps mean. This is all encapsulated through some guidance within the 3D app. But as I said, that there is a field work toolkit also provided on our website, which the students can read and, and digest and take help from before they come into the site. While we were developing this, we also developed an iPad version of it. The iPad version is very much a demo version, and we only have one of the six sites, only the site one which we first developed in Unity 3D. We've gone in to do the iPad version as well, and there isn't much of keyboard or a mouse functionality also within it. There is just a virtual joystick. But I think our main aim of developing this iPad app was to show that it is possible to have these kinds of applications on mobile devices. And we also did try for Android 
and it worked as well. And so it is not difficult to have these applications on mobile devices. We've checked that. And as more schools and institutions, other higher education institutions adopt mobile devices, we should be able to have these virtual field trips on, on mobile devices. And uh, so that is that is what we wanted to check when we were doing this project as a part of the Wolferson funding that we got when we developed this virtual Skiddaw application. So this has been, we have demonstrated this virtual field trip in a number of workshops now and uh, two of our modules at the Open University are going to be using this virtual field trip. And we see this virtual field trip very much as a space where the students can come and practice fieldwork skills like sketching, using the compass, how to observe a rock, how to make observations of a rock, looking and comparing it with a grain chart, looking under a microscope, what are the different kinds of maps that are there and how you can overlay over them over the mountains. So there are these many fieldwork skills that we are providing to them, which they can practice in this environment. So when they go for a real field trip or a physical field trip, they already have this uh, a kind of a familiarity with the area that they have been. And even if they were going to a different area to what the, the virtual field trip was all about, they have still learned those vital fieldwork skills to be able to go and apply in the new environment. They also learn about team working. They also learn about collaboration. They also learn how to how to work with a tutor when on a field trip because they are getting this practice of working in this. But they can come and practice in as many times as they want because this is a virtual environment. It's available to them at any time. And when uh, Tom and others, other of my colleagues, they take students on a on a physical field trip. Sometimes the weather can be a restriction where you may not be able to see all the six sites. Maybe the first day you went to a couple of sites and the next day it starts raining. You can't visit all the sites. But then once you've got a feel of the area and you've done some work in a physical field trip, you can come and do the remaining in a virtual field trip. In addition to that, you can also use it as a reflective tool. Once you come back, you can practice again in this field trip and you can you can do more activities into it. So this is what we've done so far and, and it's been well received and uh, we do take care that the usability, the navigation, the wayfinding, the design of the graphics, etc. Is, is very usable and it is it's it very much orients towards a student's learning. It takes the students to site from one to one, but then there is also a flexibility of jumping through the site. So you can go to site two if you would like, and especially with our distance education students who would have a very limited time every day to work on an application like this. They would rather come and do one of the sites and come and do the second site on the other day. So this just gives them the flexibility to practice uh, field working skills. What now we have done is the next steps are, and I, I'll put up that slide to show to you. Um, we've now been given a funding for about six months. And this is by the Technology Strategy Board in the UK. They're also called as Innovate UK. And in this visibility project, what they would like us to, to explore is that how much can these uh, these field trips can be adapted technologically so let's say tom at the moment has designed some activities for us in this virtual geology field trip that i've just discussed about but let's say an educator in the us he wants to adapt his adapt the activities as per his module or a, a school teacher he wants to adapt his in, in his own way, much more simpler activities to do as compared to a higher education institution. So how do we develop these applications where the lesson plans could be adapted for, for different environments and for different contexts? The other aspect that we are looking at is that 
can there be a kind of a database of virtual field trips? So can people add things as they go along into this virtual field trip? So let's say that there is another institution who have developed going to the moon, for example, or there is another uh, institution who's developed an archaeological study teaching students how to do archaeology, or there is another field trip which, has, which does about underwater marines. So can we bring these together into a kind of an ecosystem system where you can uh, you can access these virtual field trips what would be the costs involved how would the intellectual property rights work would people be willing to do that and would people have the resources to do that so that's the kind of feasibility study that we are doing and there is the, the company which is leading this is is Dayden the colleague who somehow could make it with us today then Tom and I from the Open University, Tom is my geologist colleague, as I said, who is in the audience here. And there is another company called Design Thinkers, who are very much service designers. So they are with us to how this whole ecosystem can be designed as a service. So that is what they are helping us on. But most importantly, we have colleagues from the Field Studies Council. Field Studies Council is an organization which um, which helps educators and students and provides access to a number of locations all over the UK to conduct field trips. And we are very fortunate to have the Director of Research and Policy Practice, uh, my colleague Steve Tilling, who is in the audience here. And I do remember that a couple of years ago, Steve did have this kind of a skepticism about field trips. But over a period of time, as he has worked with us along with this on this virtual field trip and on this feasibility study, there is a kind of an understanding uh, amongst us now that how these virtual field trips could work alongside physical field trips and especially with the with the funding the stem funding especially in the stem funding disciplines how these field trips could provide that additional educational aid as uh, because students in schools and in higher educations um, are not able to go to so many field trips as their educators would like them to. So can these virtual field trips serve as a useful aid uh, alongside some limited number of real field trips? So in this feasibility study, we are looking at the technical feasibility, as I discussed about the ecosystem, how easy it is to develop, how easy it is to transfer and develop these applications so that there is interoperability between the applications and how willing the institutions would be to contribute to this. We are also looking at, as I said, the pedagogical part of it, that how much of uh, learning analytics can we embed within these activities. So can we trace a student's interaction as he goes through a field trip so that we can find out which parts of the learning activity are difficult for a student so that students can work through these activities themselves, not always aided by a tutor and how much we can track their interactions with this. So learning analytics is one part that we are looking into it. We are also, as I said, looking into the commercial feasibility because we've been fortunate to get funding twice on this. But uh, it is not always possible, as we've seen over the years. All of us have been in virtual worlds for a long time now. I think I've been here since 2008, and we all know how difficult it is to get the funding. So we do want to see the commercial feasibility as well. So the ideas might be good, but do we have the money and the resources to be able to do it? Can we justify it? So let me go on to the next slide just to raise a few more points about it before we come to the to the level of questions. So what we want this service to be that it is it is location independent, it is subject independent and it's educational level independent. So what this means is that let's say we've we've got this Skiddaw Mountains. This is a site in which we've developed geological applications and geological activities. Could maybe an environmental scientist design activities within the same area so that when you develop a 3D, when you bring in a 3D area by doing, by bringing in LIDAR data or by bringing in the photogrammetry data. So a lot of work goes on in this 3D modeling when you bring in a site. Can you exploit the same site for different disciplines and for different um, educational levels? By educational levels, I mean uh, schools, further 
education, higher education. So how can these uh, 3D, 3D modeling serve the purpose of number of contexts? And how easy it is for any organization to add locations. So how do we build a, build a quality assurance process that whatever goes into this database or it goes into this ecosystem, uh, is, it, is, it quality, uh, is, it, is it good quality or not? And how much is this IT literacy that is required to develop these lesson plans? Because if a teacher has to spend a lot of time in customizing these lesson plans, is it really justified? Would they have the necessary staff development and training? So they, move, they might know all the activities because they are specialists in this area. They are geography specialists, they are environmental scientists, but you do need technical skills to be able to come into this environment and to be able to customize lesson plans. So how easy or difficult it is for them to be able to do it? What would be the skills required and what would be the training required? So can any teacher add these plans? And also we would like this application to be developed over multiple platforms or this service to be developed over multiple platforms, which is over a website. Uh, is it available as a download? Because many of these many students and educators might like to do it offline. And perhaps they don't want to do it online or, or may, they may not have the facility to be online all the time. And do we want it for Android? Do we want it for iOS? So how we can develop for different kinds of platforms. And how can this model be self-sustaining? So in the initial stages, data and the company can help in the maintenance of it. But how is the service really paid for? What is the, what is the financial model behind it? And when people contribute to this ecosystem, so somebody develops perhaps a moon, a visit to the moon or a visit to the Everest, and when they contribute to this ecosystem, what do they get in, get back from it? Is it a financial reward? Is it an in-kind reward? Or does it provide them with access to other applications? So those are the kinds of things we would like to find out because we've been funded for the phase one, which is to do the feasibility study. But then there is a scope for getting more funding in the phase two. So if they are convinced with our feasibility study, then that's the time that they would give us more funding to develop this ecosystem, as I mentioned, or the database of virtual field trips, as I mentioned. Also, as, as we know about the concerns of educators of bringing students into Second Life because of its openness and because of the diverse user base that Second Life has, when we bring them into this 3D ecosystem, can it be a safe environment? So that can you just restrict, as we do in Second Life, sometimes we restrict areas only to a set of avatars. So how can these spec tutors spec set up their specific tutorial spaces where in a particular area only their students could come and practice. So we want to look into that as well. It is possible to do it in Unity 3D. And in fact, when we were developing our virtual Skito application, at one time we did have a conversation that can we have uh, areas which are restricted to tutors or can we restrict areas so that the tutor conversations across different areas don't get muddled together. So two tutors or more than two tutors can come at the same time and guide their students. But we didn't go into detail at that time because of the time and the other resource constraints. So let me put up an ecosystem slide, which is the next one. Um, I think I've, I've explained whatever is on this slide, but I'll, I'll try my best to. Um, so let me see if the ecosystem slide comes up. Please give me a moment. I'll just try why it isn't coming.
Yes, this is the ecosystem slide, and I'm sorry if the graphics are taking a bit of time to load. Uh, this really shows the three parts, which is the authoring institution where people can add locations and lesson plans, which we've, also, which we've discussed. But there is a little box here which shows how they could be people, a subcontractor who goes and builds the, digitizes the area, gets the digital photogrammetry data, and does the 3D modeling. And, and then he takes the help of an educator who builds the activities around it. And then when we talk about the user institutions, which is the other box at the right hand side, that's where we have the educators, we have schools, we have a variety of institutions, right from schools to higher education institutions. And there we are talking about the learning analytics because of the uh, lot of focus that we have both in 2D and 3D environments now on finding out where all our users are navigating and where they're finding it difficult, where their student experience is being marred by a difficulty in navigation or by a difficulty in activity. So we would be recording the learning analytics and recording all these experiences that the students go through. And we currently do have it in virtual skitter. We can track the path of a student, but it is very textual. There are no visuals to do that. So we are hoping that the learning analytics that we propose for this ecosystem are more dashboard based and more graphics based so that educators, when they look at them, they can make some rapid decisions and some rapid interventions for their students. And also we are looking at how these institutions can add content to this virtual ecosystem. So uh, can we develop this virtual field trip service with a number of locations and with each location maybe catering to different disciplines. So that's what this ecosystem slide is showing. And the most important part of it, I think from Dayden's perspective, the company's perspective, and I'm sure from the institution, other institutions perspective is what will be the financial flow who will be paying for it and if they put this application within, within this virtual field trip service, then um, what do they get back from it? And IP is a, is, is a big issue and uh, sometimes when we, there are also copyright issues, for example, when we import maps, so sometimes those maps, etc., are only given to one institution. And if transferred to this ecosystem, multiple institutions would be using them. So can we get licenses and copyright, uh, copyright permissions for the use across number of institutions? So those are things that, that, are, that, that we are trying to uh, explore in this um, feasibility study. So let me put up the last slide now, which is the list of questions that we wanted to talk to you. I am again very sorry that David has not been able to join us because probably he would have done more justice to it as he's leading the project. But I hope I've tried my best that I've been able to get the message across. So this is the list of questions and I hope that they are visible to you. Um, the first question is, and, and I'll throw it on to the audience, and please do uh, respond in chat. And because Chantel is recording in video, I haven't checked with Chantel, but I, I do hope that it is all right to speak as well. And, and I'll close my mic after I speak the question so that if you are more comfortable talking about it rather than uh, typing it in text, I do hope that will be fine with Chantel because she is kindly uh, recording the transcript as well as doing the video recording for us. So let me do the first question. And if you have any clarifications for a question, I'm sure my colleague Tom and Steve, who are in the audience, would be also be able to answer. They are very new to Second Life. In fact, this is their second or third trip to Second Life. So I hope you will be here with them. But they are converted, and I'm sure they will get converted to Second Life, which is, which is a very good thing. So the first question is, does the virtual field trip as a service concept sound like something that would be useful to you. So here, my Second Life colleagues, that you are here, and I have had your support over many years, which I am very grateful for. Had Vic not helped me, we would have perhaps not got the first set of funding. I still remember the days when Vic helped me to understand how virtual worlds can be used for such kind of science applications. So I'm thankful to you, Vic. 
But now I would like to ask all of you here, do you feel that this concept or the ecosystem that I described, which is a collection of virtual field trips and the adaptations that educators and students can make of, would it be useful to you as, uh, as in your schools or colleges or universities and for your students? And what are the kinds of things that you would like to be addressed that I haven't talked about so far? So I'll stop now, I'll close my mic and I'll give you the chance to give us your answer. Eight bit, if I may ask, you mentioned about you said that you would be happy to bring students to these uh, uh, to these places or the field trips that we develop. Uh, what kind of challenges do you feel of developing these field trips in your institutions?
Thank you very much. Uh, this has been very, very helpful, and I'm, I'm uh, very grateful for all the discussions. Let's move on to the second question. I think we've covered bits of it already. Uh, the second question is on the slide is, what do you see are the biggest attractions and the benefits? So we've talked about the global audience and bringing in people from different countries and different institutions. And, uh, and we've also talked about, and some of it I've covered in my talk about the, uh, the uh, benefits of virtual field trips. But could you kindly talk more about the virtual field trip as a service? That is this ecosystem of field trips and the flexibility to change and adapt things for different disciplines, like using the same area for different disciplines. So uh, if you can elaborate more on the benefits of that, many thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, may I just say that my colleague David has now arrived. Um, David, it was David's vision and help that uh, that we got this virtual field trip developed. As you know, we have this skepticism against uh, for Second Life, and our institution is the same. We didn't want uh, a solution for our field trip to be in Second Life because of the constraints that it would have in terms of not having a closed environment, something that we could control. And it was David who suggested that we do it in Unity 3D. And uh, we as academics and as requirements, uh, uh, who were giving the requirements to David, we almost wanted a second life to be built within Unity 3D. And David uh, helped us to develop most of the functionality that we wanted uh, into, uh, into this Unity 3D field trip. So, David, I'll hand over the floor to you. We've done the first two questions on your slide. If you wanted to guide us to the three, the last three questions, last four questions, they know about the ecosystem. We've discussed about it and, and so on. So we've set the stage for you now. And I'll, I'll leave it to you, David. The, the, the process is this, that we, I speak in, uh, I speak the question and then colleagues write it in chat. So if you could start with the third question. Thank you, David. 
Okay, thanks, Shaley, and uh, sorry for leaving you in the lurch there. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, question number, uh, so it's the third question or fourth question, Shaley, is you after? Number three. It is a third bullet, David. Third bullet. Okay, so, third. okay. Okay, so the third bullet is, is probably particularly um, relevant given the sort of the Second Life audience. Um, and, you know, technically we're really reasonably confident we can go away and build this. Um, but the question is, if we do build it, then how do we actually get it into the hands of, of teachers and actually in front of students? As I'm sure we're all aware, um, you know, trying to get Second Life beyond a relatively small circle of people um, and into a very wide variety of schools has been a real challenge. Um, and one of the reasons why this whole project has been set up uh, the, by the Technology Strategy Board in the UK is very specifically to look at technologies where they've been proven in places, but for various reasons they fail to actually make it into the whole of the educational system. Um, and so what this question very much is about is, is what do you think are the, are the barriers, so accepting that something actually works, what are the actual barriers to actually making it more widely available uh, within the school and the educational system? And I think that's that's fundamentally in a nutshell. Uh, and obviously, we're particularly interested in it as it refers to uh, to, to what we're building for virtual field trips, but it can also be broadened out into the whole of the virtual world space. So, yeah, I think the point from Vic there about, um, you know, the, the browse the web experience, um, one of the things we're doing is obviously we're asking uh, the, the, the schools, you know, what is the technology you are actually using in your schools? Um, and, you know, for a lot of them, you know, if, if it's something you can get access to through a browser, uh, then obviously that means there's a whole raft of, of deployment issues that they don't actually have. Um, whereas if it's got something they've got to install onto their desktops, obviously a lot of schools have very locked down desktops. Um, and so the ability to actually put a new application onto that desktop is a real challenge. Uh, one of the problems that we've got um, going forward uh, is, as many of you may well know, Unity has a plug-in option uh, that go in the browser so you can run it actually in the browser. The problem is a number of the browser uh, manufacturers, lead, with Chrome I think in the lead, are beginning to disable that sort of plug-in functionality. So whilst we've been able to deliver functionality in the browser with, with Unity, um, that may not be an option um, in the sort of the medium to long term. But the, the response from Unity to that, and also the one we're looking at, is increasing the use of WebGL. And one of the things that Unity is looking at is the ability to actually generate WebGL uh, straight out of the, of the application, uh, because WebGL obviously doesn't need a plugin for the browser. Uh, one of the problems with WebGL, though, of course, is that most schools and most organizations don't have the very latest browsers, uh, so they can't necessarily uh, integrate with them. And again, from Vic, I think, yeah, the point about, you know, trying to absolutely uh, minimize the learning curve um, is one of the key things. And, and a lot of that is obviously about good application design, uh, which is why we've got people like design thinkers uh, sort of on board with us to think through what that process is of getting, you know, somebody from first launching the application to get them actually in world and beginning to, to use the application. I mean, what's, I'd be interested to know what sort of challenges sort of people around here have actually had in, in just sort of trying to get Second Life uh, sort of more widely adopted within their organisations and their institutions. Uh, so 8-Bit, do you have any particular issues with sort of things like IT departments and IT networks, or have they been uh, very supportive of you? <laughs> oh, right, yeah. as you say, one of the issues is, uh, is, that, is that too risky for the point of view of, of what other content and what else they could do in the space?
yeah, that's definitely the attraction of using using an open sim environment or a Unity environment is obviously we can just deliver uh, the content uh, that we want the students to have. One of the things that, that we were always frustrated about with open sim uh, was the fact there was never actually a browser that was completely stripped down uh, that we could use purely for educational purposes. And I know there was some discussion around that on the sled list uh, fairly recently again, I think. Okay, just conscious of uh, time. Um, so if we just move on to um, uh, the next bullet point with there, um, which is rather than thinking about purely the, the issues about technically getting it into uh, the schools and onto the desktops, um, is actually getting student and uh, teacher value from it. Uh, so really, what is it the application has got to do um, in order to really uh, deliver um, as far as both the, st the student and the, and the teachers are concerned? And obviously here particularly thinking about sort of the, the virtual field trip side, but again interested in, in broader um, uh, issues with, the, with virtual learning. Yeah, Delenn's point about ports, um, one of the attractions of, uh, of using something like Unity is what we will be able to do with the virtual field trip um, is actually provide it in both a standalone mode and a multi-user mode. Uh, so if people, do, or sorry, a single user and a multi-user mode, so if people have access with ports, uh, then actually they can run it up in the single user experience. Not exactly the same, obviously, as multi-user, but at least they still got access to the environment and the functionality in the environment. Yeah, Vic again talking about um, sort of integrating with lessons models. Um, one of the things we're interested to do here at the UK is, is talk to the awarding bodies um, and the people who are actually setting the curriculum uh, so as to make sure that what we're doing is, is aligned with the curriculum. Uh, for instance, while things talking, uh, uh, Tom was talking to us recently um, and they were talking about the changes in, in GSCs in the UK for geography. Uh, traditionally, it's been very much uh, human, or sorry, traditionally, as in the last 20 years, um, it's been very much human geography uh, focused, uh, where the virtual field trip still has value, uh, but it's probably more, more sophisticated to create. Um, but what we're do, what they're doing now is beginning to swing back a bit to to physical geography in Oxbow Lakes, um, which is back right back into our space. Um, and actually within that, there are very specific areas that the curriculum is looking at covering. Uh, so things like um, it river profiling and, and, and that sort of work. Um, and so obviously for us, you know, trying to make sure that from the outset we can offer the environments that support the curriculum uh, are a good way of doing things. Um, yeah, Null Subset talking about uh, APIs and educational functionality. Uh, could you sort of be, be a bit more specific on that? Obviously, one of the things we're looking at is uh, things like Tin Can APIs, some of you may be aware of, uh, which is sort of beginning to, to, to replace SCORM uh, so we can integrate back into uh, learning management systems and VLEs, uh, both for the registration of students, um, but also for reporting of their progress and, and results. Yeah, and Stephen, talk about uh, educational artifacts, um, sort of unique to each student. Uh, do you mean in terms of uh, sort of educational experiences um, or in terms of their ability to sort of customize or contribute sort of user-generated content? 